Welcome to the latest Sitting Comfortably podcast. This is Laurel Lindstrom speaking, reading from The Draftsman, my first novel. This is the third podcast in a series. I, can't, I have no idea how many there will be, but uh, I'm not going to recap everything that we've done so far. Just the last episode. That was when Simon and Martin meet for the first time. Simon is the gardener. We find out a little bit more about why Martin's bought the house. So, are we sitting comfortably? Then I'll begin. The Draftsman, Chapter 1, Part 3 Martin turned to his sister. Is there milk in the fridge, so that we can have a cup of tea? Alison forgot the daffodils she was arranging. Cup of tea? What? But you don't drink tea. Since when do you want tea? Her staccato questions, rising in pitch as they ran along, interspersed with her tight, breathy laughs, her own uncertain, unsung punctuation. Eventually, the questions were lost in the high and tinselly squeak she usually reserved for cocktail parties with her husband's business colleagues. Martin, already at the fridge, had the answer to his own question. Ignoring his sister, Martin looked at the coffee and cakes on the counter and said, nor is there tea. He saw that the fridge did have the 24 bottles of Paul Roger champagne he'd requested, along with stacks of small tins of tuna fish in brine. Good. Turning to Simon, he stared a moment at him and his now upstanding grey hair and handed over an untidy bundle of notes. Go and get some for us, would you? Take the car. Keys in the ignition. Oh, and get me a bin as well. Get bins for all the rooms, all the same, small and chrome. Get them delivered if you can't fit them in the car. Are you sure, sir? Simon replied, hesitant and glancing out of the window at gleaming red, hard-shelled perfection. This monster looked almost alive, pawing the ground with and rabid with lethal manic tendencies. Um... I'm more a Mandeo man myself, he mumbled, staring at the beast. He glanced down again at the holy socks and, spreading his grimy hands, remembered the muddy boots waiting for him by the front door. Not keen, he thought, not keen. But Martin was still gazing at him, just waiting. It's Martin. We'll need about a dozen. One for here and one each everywhere else. Alison was confused. Bins? Are you serious? Bins were not on the list was just the best she could come up with. Martin ignored her, and watched Simon slope off to get his boots and prepare to do battle with the beast and the bins. Alison, with her daffodils nodding in their jar, while her fingers twitched and plucked at them, was talking half to herself in a series of low-level little clucks and chortles, wondering if this thing with the tea and the bins meant change of a sort. It was almost certainly out of character. Almost ordinary, she muttered. She kept pinching and pulling at the flowers, her head on one side and then the other, furtively watching Martin, looking for tangible hints of change. She saw none. Martin, unaware of her sly glances, was fixed instead on the alien faceless space around him and the whispers he thought he heard. He looked at his mobile phone. Whispers, not fizz. Echoes, not static. Curious, there was no signal no sign of missed calls or messages, and somehow this was a good thing. He lit another cigarette and looked towards the stillness, beckoning from the rooms beyond. Alison noticed him, absent-mindedly checked the phone and asked, Have you got signal? His phone back in his pocket, Martin stared through the question and said, Is the Wi-Fi set up? Well, yes, like you said you wanted it. Top of the line, and that's what's been installed. State of the art. I sent you a text with the code. Try it on your Mac, she replied uneasily. No, don't know. Don't uh, don't worry about it. I don't need it now. And Alison was once more confused as she watched him stare again out at the gloomy afternoon as it shuffled off into the shadows beyond the kitchen windows. She joined him and put her hand under his arm for a fleeting moment snug against the stick-thin arm in its velvet sleeve before he pulled away. Side by side they watched Simon jolt along the drive for a few metres before suddenly letting go and disappearing around the bend. 
Martin's lips curved, almost imperceptibly, into the slightest of smiles as he remembered what it felt like that morning, driving the new car from the showroom in South Kensington. He had not jolted, but the creature had terrified him, a satisfying, cathartic terror, his reward. After a lifetime in the back backs of black cabs, he'd set himself the task of driving to his new house alone, which required buying a car, collecting it, finding his way out of London and into the right county unaided, before tracking down his new address. All of this he had done, minorly ordinary and yet thrilling, unctuous and oily, with a bumped and pitted complexion, Chris Curtis at Prestige Motors of Kensington had not expected someone so young to collect the car, and Martin unnerved him. He had never met the buyer of the red Ferrari F430 Coupé, nor had he ever sold one over the phone before, though he knew it was not unusual. But the money had been wired months ago, and the order went through, so here he was, about to hand over the keys and paperwork to this oddly disengaged and uncommunicative young man. Chris Curtis bit at the hangnails on his thumb, anxiously struggling to reconcile the sale with the purchaser, sitting on the other side of his desk. Martin looked an unlikely candidate for 4.3 litres of raw power, capable of getting from naught to 62 in 3.9 seconds. Slow shuffling the papers on his desk, Chris Curtis had finished with his thumb, which was starting to bleed a little. He fiddled with his Perspex name badge, making sure it was absolutely horizontal before rummaging in a drawer for a pen. He glanced pointlessly at the telephone, but the telephone was silent. The two of them sat, Martin motionless and Chris Curtis, a mess of nervous fidgeting. He hummed a little as inane reworkings of modern hits slithered along the office walls before one by one they breathed their last and faded gently and unopposed into the carpet. Chris Curtis took another deep breath and let it out long and slow and asked Martin for some ID. You know, we have to ask, it's really more of a formality. He tried unsuccessfully to look his client in the eye and not to be unnerved by Martin's unbroken silence. Picking at some spot on the back of his neck, head at an angle, and his elbow held high for protection, Chris Curtis read over the passport and driver's licence, quizzically tut tut tutting to himself, lips pursed tight. The breath was easing and gradually his nerves were coming under control. He told himself that it had just been unexpected when Martin rolled in and said he had come to collect the car. It was just a shock, nothing more. Heads in the showroom had turned to take in this tall, slender man in his calf-length navy blue velvet coat. They had noticed its heavy, full-skirted swing and the black boots as they slapped loud on the stylish grey and gleaming showroom floor. No one thought he was there to collect a car, not from here, not from Prestige Motors, providers of performance cars to the discerning and extremely wealthy, but he was. Chris Curtis's anxiety prevented him from launching into his carefully prepared patter about the car, what they had done to prepare it, the full fuel tank, the requested A to Z and the map of South East England. His brain could only cope with thoughts of how long before the beautiful beast would be nothing more than mangled metal, a prancing horse no more, how long before it would be trapped under a bus, or glittered with plate glass exploded out of some posh shop window, passers-by standing gawping in horror at the gruesome end of a 196 mile per hour engineering wonder. Breathe, breathe. His customer just stared at him, watching, noting the blackheads on Chris Curtis's forehead, unconcealed with pale pink concealant, tiny beads of sweat slowly rising to join them. Chris Curtis squeezed out an insincere and thin-lipped smile as he stood up, jingling the single key encouragingly, trying in vain to tease. Bobbing up and down a little more than he would have liked, Chris Curtis ushered Martin out of the showroom towards his new car. The fresh air helped and reminded Chris Curtis that according to Martin's passport, he was not a boy. Twenty-four is old enough, surely. As he opened the car door and showed his customer where the ashtray was, the waft of new car smell, all vinyl, leather and solvents, mingled with the morning air, 
and Martin's cigarette smoke. As Martin eased himself into the deep white leather, cigarette ash drifted gently down to lie in fragile and dainty comfort on the pristine red mats. He listened to what he was told, looked about the car, snapped his seat belt on, and remembered to fiddle with the mirror just like his dad always did. Then he just waited for Chris Curtis to stop. Martin looked up at Chris Curtis as he closed the door and stepped away from the car, his hands clasped in silent prayer at his chest, his teeth bared in an awful grin. With a short nod, Martin clicked the key until the engine jumped alive, allowed it a momentary roar, then put it in gear to inch away towards the edge of the forecourt, which seemed a very long way off. Numbers were rushing to his aid. The distance, speed, wheel rotations, fuel consumption. Numbers got him to the edge where Martin paused, put his indicator on and listened to its satisfying binary click for a few seconds before pulling cautiously out into the traffic. Four metres, three miles per hour, six. Too soon to know. Watching Martin drive away, Chris Curtis remembered his commission on the £165,000 sale and comforted himself with the thought that if 1996 SH did by some sad chance end up under a bus or as a new feature in a shop window, there might be another commission to come. Thus encouraged, he waved and as the car moved gingerly out into the seething traffic, wondered what the SH stood for and why 1996. Martin, aware of his audience, glanced, glanced at his rear-view mirror, uneasy but in control and steady on the pedals as he teased the beast ahead, pressing and slipping the clutch, gradually learning how to hold it. London traffic, in its usual confused tangle, was a rising mass surrounding him, insidious and threatening. Martin could feel it, longing to reach out and touch the car's gleaming perfection, to claim it with some ugly pinch, a bruise, or graze, a kiss, touch. The tiniest touch threatened with every movement as Martin inched along the Cromwell Road, heading west for the M4. His head was pounding and bizarre tingling cramps touched his hands and feet. A confusion of fear and ancient fragments in his brain mingled with memories of touch, of water turning cold and grey, of running lines rolling and dripping from his body as she lifted him out of the bath and into a rough and thinning towel. Loud honking from behind and 1996 SH jumped forward, leading the herd through the now green light across a suddenly shrinking expanse of open tarmac before reaching the next halt. It took over an hour for Martin to get beyond second gear, and all the while the rush in his head was screaming, screaming, and he screamed back, No, no, you can't touch me, you can't touch me now. And soon the traffic was easing, and then quickly fading into the distance. And that's the end of this podcast. We'll be back another time with another one. I hope you enjoyed it. My name's Laurel Lindstrom and I've been reading from The Draftsman, due for publication in September sometime, I think, with Unbound. Thanks for listening again. Bye!